This is Attack of the 20th Century. Thank you for joining us as we explore science fiction, fantasy, and horror films of the 20th century. I'm your host, Jeff. And I'm your other host, Kim. Welcome to episode 43. We are reviewing Horror Express, directed by Eugenio Martin from 1972. Look for us on Instagram and Facebook at Attack of the 20th Century. That's 20TH. We post our next movie selection there. You can comment, give your thoughts, and they just might make it on the air. Well, first of all, welcome back, Kim. It's good to have you back. Thank you. It's good to be back. So when me and Mike were doing the Evil Dead series review, uh, you had been on a trip with our son to Alaska and a cruise, your first cruise ever. My first cruise and my first trip to Alaska. So kind of a big deal. <laughs> so how did you enjoy the cruising experience? Um, it's unique. It is, if you like food and you like just good Check. food, Brought to you all the time, as much as you want. Yep, check. <laughs> Cruising is for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I liked it. We had a really good time. We, of course, were there with the best of people because it was Jefferson's senior class and, and some of their parents. And uh, just, you know, just a great way to wrap up that season of life for him. Um, I think I wouldn't prefer cruising in the future like it's not um, going to be my new favorite way to travel yeah uh but an, a cruise here and there i think you know it could be fun you're more active i am and and there are ways to be active on a cruise ship there, mm -hmm. there's a very nice gym on the cruise ship but i'm not really a gym goer i'm more of a like be outside and be active person mm -hmm. um and so it was a little and jefferson's very similar and that, mm -hmm. so it was a little, it felt like we were in a shopping mall 24 seven. That's okay. kind of how we wrapped it up. <laughs> and I, I, if you know me and I'm not saying that I hate cruising cause I definitely did not hate it at all, but I do hate shopping malls. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there was, you kind of have to get past it, which is, a, it comes with amazing benefits because there's shows, there's live music. There's literally like entertainment around every corner. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just a very different vibe. We're used to like picking an Airbnb in an obscure spot and hiking little towns and learning their nooks and crannies. And, and yeah. you just, it's different. You, you don't get much of that on a cruise. We typically pick a location, research all the things that you could do right. and kind of map out our own course. Whereas on a cruise, you're kind of, you do what the cruise does. Right. Exactly. Which there's a lot of things, but it's not stuff that we would have normally chosen to do on right. a different adventure. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining about like probably one of the most amazing things I've ever done. <laughs> Tell us more about your woes of being oh, on a seven day no, cruise in Alaska. Suffering. <laughs> it was just, just suffering. All the know. food you could eat. The, the food was phenomenal though. Okay. Like the food, I just can't even hold my word. So let me ask you between all your cruising and, you know, <laughs> wrapping up school for our senior, mm -hmm. what have you been watching lately? Oh, wow. Um, I would say not a lot, but I did have, you know, a very long flight to and from Seattle. And so to Seattle, I think I slept almost the entire time. But on the way home, I made a point to watch, um, I think it's a 2022 movie, The Banshees of Inishirin has Colin Farrell in it. Okay. We flew Alaskan Air. So it's the first time I've flown where they don't have, it's not the first time I've flown and there's not a TV on the seat back in front of me, uh -huh. but it's the first time I've flown where there's not a TV in front of me, but they have streaming, free streaming through your own device. So as long as I got oh. on the plane's Wi-Fi, I could pick from their shows and movies they had from their oh, that's website. Cool. Yeah. So that was kind of interesting and they had a pretty good catalog. I mean, it's pretty, pretty deep selection. Um, but I had... Barely heard of Banshees of Inishirin before. Uh -huh. It's an Irish movie. Um, we have some favorite, some family favorites that are Irish movies. So I, yeah. I had high hopes for it. And there, I would say of the Irish movies I know, I'm not well versed in that. Uh, mm -hmm. They're usually slow storytelling, which I love mm -hmm. if it's done well. And you know, I love everything from you know the United Kingdom, Ireland, right. England, all of that. So I was like, yeah, Very let's true. try it. Let's watch this. Um, so it was funny. It was entertaining and interesting. I didn't like how it ended up. And since it's not a movie we're reviewing, I won't give spoilers, but, okay. um, I had questions for it for sure. Questions. So yeah, that's, that's me. You know, you were hoping was, for waking Ned divine. It was not waking Ned divine. It was uh. not uproariously funny like waking <laughs> Ned divine. And I realized that me using the word uproariously funny with waking Ned divine is probably not everyone's going to 
laugh uproariously at Ned Divine <laughs> like we do, but we do. Yeah, that's a great film. And this this one had its quirky, really funny moments and really moments that make you kind of scratch your head. And it really makes you think about human interaction because mm-hmm. it's really about just the the breakdown of a long time friendship. And you and you're not you don't really know why. And you don't really get a lot of resolution. So oh. I'll leave it at that. Okay. So. Well, uh, so we've always wanted to watch Leon the Professional. There's that famous scene in the film, and it's a scene that I've shared with the kids before on YouTube, but where Gary Oldman tells his henchman, bring me everyone. <laughs> the guy, henchman says, what do you mean everyone? And he screams out at the top of his lungs, everyone! Yeah. <laughs> So this is a film that's directed by Luke Besson. Of course, he did The Fifth Element. And this film predates The Fifth Element by a few years. Um, So it stars John Renault, Gary Oldman, like I mentioned, and a 13-year-old Natalie Portman. Yeah. And just if you haven't seen it before, it's this story of a lone hitman who can't read or write. He takes in this young girl who's she's got an abusive family uh, that gets into this bad drug deal and they end up getting murdered Mm -hmm. by Gary Oldman and his henchmen. Uh, And so he's our main baddie. He's got this lucrative side gig selling drugs, but for his main job, I guess he's a cop. (laughs) Yeah. Which plot twist. We didn't find that out till pretty good ways into the movie. Yeah. Maybe I should have said that's a spoiler, but he murders anybody that gets in his way. Natalie Portman is this uh, little 13 year old girl and she wants revenge, and she wants to become a hitman and learn from this guy who's taken her in, Jean Renault. And he's, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, he's he's a loner. He can't read or write. And so this well, unlikely really, friendship develops between the two. He's an immigrant, too. It's just really an immigrant story here, right? Oh, like yeah. He, he had, you know, I guess fallen into the hands of the wrong people when he immigrated to America and right. got... All right, must have already had a certain set of skills. Yeah, <laughs> and so they somebody took advantage. A, a local mob boss took advantage of that and employed him, and has sort of been taking care of him. Yeah, care of him and he time. manages his money for him because yeah. you know banks. You can't trust banks. Yeah, that's what he tells him. Uh, but yeah, I have to say, Natalie Portman pretty much stole every scene she was in. Truly, and I can't say that we've been super well versed in Natalie Portman's, you know, film discography, but when I look at like what she did a few years later in Star Wars, I'm like, what happened? Because <laughs> I felt like she was pretty wooden as Princess Amidala. And yeah, that maybe that's not a and Padme. Yeah, maybe that's not a great take, uh, but that's kind of how I saw it. Like she was a little wooden. Yeah. And I don't know, but when I see her in the Leon the Professional Oh my gosh. I'm, I don't know if I've ever seen a child actor performance as good as this. No, it's it's insane. Like, it's really... And, okay, caveat. I, I'm sure people listening to this probably have already seen this movie. I had no idea how gory this movie was. Really? Going into it. Yeah, mm-hmm. how rough it was. I mean, it's gang. It's drug lords and gang violence. So, there you go. Yeah. I should have... I didn't know. I really knew nothing about this movie. I just yeah. knew you guys have been wanting and wanting to see this. So And, you know, apparently Gary Oldman, like, sets the standard for bad guys yeah. in this movie. Like, he created almost a new genre mm-hmm. of bad guys, right? Yeah, he's super unhinged, really unpredictable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he, he was fantastic. He, Gary Oldman's always fantastic. He though. really is. Yeah. I, the big surprise for me was Natalie Portman. I just was, I couldn't believe so you, how she pulled me in. Yeah. She's 13. I know she's playing probably a 12 or 13 year old in the movie, but she was she's actually really 13, 13 when yeah. she filmed this. Yeah. I mean, she plays it as a much older. Yeah. She doesn't look like she's older than 13, but the, her acting ability, you would think she would have been a yeah. much more seasoned right. actor. Yeah. What film are we reviewing today? All right. Today we're going to talk about 1972's Horror Express, which you might want to know has an 80% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Excellent. All right. So just uh, for those of you who haven't watched this and don't like spoilers, this is your warning. Hit pause, go catch this movie and come back and join us later. 
So it's based, it's set in 1906 with Professor Sir Alexander Saxton, a British anthropologist who is returning to Europe by the Trans-Siberian Express from Shanghai all the way to Moscow. And he has a crate from one of his most recent archaeological, anthropological find. And he thinks in this crate is like the missing link that's going to explain evolution for right. everybody in the world, right? And he's uber protective of this thing. Very protective, very mysterious. We've only seen one, at this point, one little glimpse of what's inside this crate, and it kind of looks like a frozen monkey. Yeah, it does. A big frozen monkey, Yeah, right? Okay, so he's at the train station. Some weird things happen. A thief tries to break into his crate, and weirdly, the thief ends up dead. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of a scuffle, but everybody gets on the train and we're headed across Siberia. And he's not just dead, but he's dead with like the whites of his eyes showing and nothing else. That's true. He's just stone cold dead on the platform of the train station and his eyeballs are snow white. Yeah. Which is kind of weird. Kind of weird, but we move on. We get on the train. Anyhow. Yeah. We're like, okay, yeah, let's go anyway. And Professor, Professor Saxton's crate gets loaded on the train. Kind of no questions asked. Mm -hmm. Not too many questions asked. So meanwhile, now we're on the train and we're headed through Siberia. Well, also on this train is Dr. Wells and he's Saxton's not really friend, kind of a frenemy. They're yeah. like friendly rivals from the same, I don't know, men's club, yeah. smart guys club, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, well, Wells' uh, curiosity is piqued because weird things are happening with this crate. So he bribes one of the train porters to investigate the crate. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for that train porter, he also dies. Wide eyes and all. Yep. Also on board this train, we probably need to know, is that there's an inspector, there's a Polish count and his countess, and their own personal spiritual advisor and East Eastern Orthodox, uh, Father Pajardiv, mm -hmm. I think is how we say his name, and a handful of other, you know, cast members that we'll probably mention at some point. Well, investigation ensues. This inspector that's on the train, he's Inspector Miroff, he starts wanting to know, okay, now we have two people dead in this weird crate on my on this train. We need to know what's going on. Well, killings continue, and then finally the inspector shoots and kills the monster. The monster actually gets out of the box, right? right. And some other people die. The inspector gets a chance to shoot the monster. Okay, so now Dr. Wells and his assistant... They do a little autopsy on this monster ape mm -hmm. artifact. Saw its head open. And they saw its head open and look at his brain. Not the first thing I would have thought to do, but yeah. okay. So look at his brain and there are two major findings there. One, this creature has a completely smooth brain. I think you have to have wrinkles in your brain, like when you collect knowledge and stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Isn't that what we say about like teenagers, young adults, they're still smooth brains yeah. <laughs> and haven't developed their wrinkles yet. So all of the knowledge and memories from uh, that they would have had are gone. They've been drained yeah. from these people that are now killed, right? Um, and when they look at the juice in the eyeball <laughs> of the dead people and the eyeball of the monster... There's all these, it's like a, what's those things we used to have as a kid? A viewfinder. Viewfinder, yeah. Yeah, it's like a viewfinder. They keep sliding, swiping through these pictures of like dinosaurs and the creation of the earth and yeah. just all sorts of things. And so they're realizing, wait, this monster has memories from the beginning of our time. Like yeah. The beginning of history, basically. R right. They, so, saw, they saw a still shot of the earth. And at this point, 1906, nobody had been to space. Nobody had seen the Earth. That's so, true. So that had to be crazy cool and exciting. Exactly. Exactly. Wait, that, I think that's our planet. How do yeah. they even know what Earth looked like? <laughs> I don't know. And I will say at this point, when they're showing off the eyeball, this father, he figures out that the alien possesses the inspector's body. He mm -hmm. figures that out. And he thinks that this, he hasn't figured out this is an alien. He thinks this thing's a Satan. Right. Yeah. And through a series of events, pledges allegiance. Like, he switches teams. He he gives a real bad name to the Eastern Orthodox Church, actually. Yes, he does. he's, like, real quick to be like, oh, this is Satan. I'm not going to be a church guy anymore. I'm going to be a Satan guy now. Yeah. It's yeah. a little off-putting. But yeah. we'll get to him later. All right. So, we're learning now that this thing is, like, an extraterrestrial. It's been stranded on Earth for millions of years. It's killing passengers on the train that it thinks has knowledge or knows has knowledge that's going to help him to eventually build some sort of craft to get back off of Earth because yeah. he's been stuck there forever and ever and ever, right? right? So 
the monkey is dead, but the whatever was inhabiting the monkey is still hopping around other people on the train. Yeah, at this point, he's in the inspector. Yeah, he's in the inspector, and nobody really knows that except for Pajardov. Right. Saxton decides, you know, we got to radio ahead to some of these other train stations and let them know things are going awry on Mm -hmm. this train. We're going to need some help. So he radios ahead, lets them know they have dangers. When they get to the next train stop, a Cossack Captain Kazan... Uh, stops the train, he gets on, interrogates everybody, and he actually kills Inspector Miroff. Because at that right. point we realize, oh, Miroff has the the bug now, right? Miroff yeah. is the problem. So he kills Miroff. And this guy is played by Telly Savalas. Yeah. And he is just this brash character, tough guy. Yeah. You th- and he's going to get to the bottom of this. Real he doesn't have machado, time. Machado, right? Like, yeah. Machismo. Machismo, what's, what's yeah. What's the word I'm looking for? Yeah. He kicks butt and takes names type guy. And he's not going to let any alien or any ghost or anything get in his way. Right. So, unfortunately, though, when he kills Inspector Miroff, the alien transfers into the body of the monk and then kills all of the soldiers and the captain. Yes. <laughs> so, Saxon and Wells get everybody to retreat to the last car. I think they call it the, what, the brake car mm-hmm. on the train? The caboose. We'll call it the caboose. The caboose. All right. And so then Saxon and Wells go off to hunt the alien. They corner him. But he uses his alien powers to resurrect all the dead soldiers yeah. that, are, that are now lying about. All the white eyes. Yeah, all the white eyes come back to life. So now we have like a zombie army uh, going to try and take out Saxon and Wells. But thankfully, someone has radioed ahead to the next train station and said, listen, this train has gone bad. Yeah. We, it's gone sideways. You just need to let that train go off a cliff. <laughs> so they switch the train tracks, and basically this train is headed for a certain doom. Like yeah. it's, it's just going to fly off a frozen cliff into the Siberian tundra. Is, this, is Siberia I guess so. tundra? Yeah, hit know. rocks, explode. Uh, Saxton has to fight his way through the zombies. He gets back to the final car, and he and Wells are able to detach the final car from the rest of the train, and the whole front... 90% of the train with the zombie army and the extraterrestrial creature thing fly off the cliff and the good guy's train car stops, of course, right before it tips over the edge of the yeah. cliff. In fact, they seem pretty unconcerned. They lean over the edge and I'm like, that would not be me. I'd be like, <laughs> is there a back door on this thing? Everybody to the very back, yeah. <laughs> get out that way. Do not lean over the edge. But we do credits. see a fiery mass at the bottom of the ravine, right? And we're yeah. to, to assume that that They're fire dead. and that crash has taken care of the alien, the alien, the zombies, everything else. Yeah. Yeah. So also on board, we haven't mentioned, well, I sort of mentioned the Polish count, Petrovsky, his wife, Countess Arena. There's a spy named Natasha. She's looking for a special metal that can survive temperatures. There's kind of a lot of other people doing other things, and we'll probably right. hit on them later. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yep. Fantastic. That's our story. So if you haven't guessed, this film is a fairly low-budget movie. It was filmed in Spain in roughly two weeks in 1971, mostly without the live audio. So they wanted to go back and be able to overdub the oh. voices. Mm-hmm. And thank God they actually used like Christopher Lee's voice, Peter oh. Cushing's voice, Telly Savalas for the English. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize, oh, if I if you had me sit down and watch this movie and someone other than Christopher Lee's voice came out of Christopher Lee's face, I I don't know. That yeah. may have unhinged me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like Black Sabbath we watched in the Italian version. Oh yeah. But in English, they had somebody dub Boris Karloff's voice. It's right. Like, you don't dub Boris Karloff's voice. No way. Yeah. Uh, But in fact, all the women were dubbed by a lady named Olive Gregg. Oh, that's why they all sound so similar. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So they actually hit kind of potluck with this movie. They were able to use the same train interiors and the model train as the film Pancho Villa. It had just completed filming. So they were like, hey, what are you going to do with that stuff? We'd (laughs) (laughs) We'd like to borrow that. Thank you. And so that's why, even though it's fairly low budget, it looks pretty good. Yeah, I was going to say, the set does not really look low budget at all. Uh, So during the movie, at some point, you know, it switches to like this alien story. And I started picking up similarities with The Thing and The Thing from Another World, which were based on the novella Who Goes There. Apparently, there's no official credits associated with that work, but there's definitely some similarities going on. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, also, even though this is Cushing, this is Lee, you know, the biggest stars in Hammer, this is not a horror film that made by Hammer. Okay. Uh, and it's actually a rare time when the duo kind of pairs up and works together. Oh, yeah, that's cool. true. They're not fighting each other. We're not going to do a big deep dive in the history of Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee because this is maybe the fifth film of theirs we've reviewed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we've talked about what they've done previously professionally. But there's a story here that I think is really compelling. And mm -hmm. that's in real life, these men were the best of friends. Yeah. Cushing's wife, Helen, died in January of 1971. They're filming this movie in December of the same year. This mm. is his first holiday season without her. He shows up on day one, Cushing that is, and he says to the producer, I don't think I can do this movie. Mm. Like, I am really uh, an emotional wreck. Yeah. I don't think I can work. So they talk to Christopher Lee. What happened? Christopher Lee compels him. Peter, you know, we've been through a lot of great times together filming mm. movies, you know, and they had been since, I guess, the mid-50s. Wow. He talked him into it. Let's go ahead and do this thing. During those two weeks, he was having night terrors, waking up in the middle of the night. Just this impact of his losing his wife was so oh. great. Well, Christopher Lee not only said, hey, I'll sleep in the same room with you, but slept in the same bed with him. I'm your friend. I am here. You're not alone. Wow. And I thought, Wow. What a story of friendship. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I thought that was really incredible. Yeah, that's really touching. That that makes the movie even cooler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or really, their body of work in general. That's just it's yeah. really cool. Re very inspiring. Mm -hmm. All right, so when did you first see this film, and what was your first impression? Well, I first saw this film this week. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's... So I don't have any like nostalgic fond memories to go back on, but I did come in with some expectations knowing mm -hmm. that it's a Cushing and Lee duo. Mm -hmm. um, I knew it wasn't a hammer horror film or maybe, maybe I didn't even know that at the time. Maybe that was something you told me later. So I probably just came in with the assumption that, Oh, it's a hammer horror film. Yeah. I know what the lighting's going to look like. I know what colors to expect. I know what the feel of the movie mm -hmm. is going to be like. So I thought, and for the most part, a lot of that did run, true for this movie uh -huh. it still felt similar to a hammer horror but not in the classic monster sense so that was yeah. kind of a surprise for mm -hmm. me it was, it, this was more of a i mean there was a monster but there was definitely more of a sci-fi and murder mystery twist to this yeah so it was very surprising and interesting for me mm -hmm. yeah let's see i saw this once the week before you saw it I did a quick preview to see, hmm, is this something that we could review? And then, uh, yeah, this is great. Let's do this. So then I talked you into watching <laughs> it with me last week. And yeah, same thing. When I first saw it, especially when they have this kind of ape-like creature start killing people mm -hmm. and they have the priest that's saying, you know, hey, this thing's evil, blah, blah, blah. Right. I thought, okay, I know exactly what movie I'm getting into. <laughs> and you know, there's tons of movies. There's nothing wrong with that. A lot of the classic horror kind of is pretty predictable. Right. But I was intrigued at how unpredictable this film was and how it kind of shifted, you know, from a, a monster story mm -hmm. to kind of a an good versus evil story. Right. To the, wait, no, this is, a, they're not fighting Satan. They're not fighting the devil. They're fighting an alien. Right. So right. it became a sci-fi story near the end. Mm -hmm. Well, and there was still that element of like a murder mystery. It had very much um, a murder on the Orient Express vibe to it. Yeah. Like right away when I realized like, oh, we're legit on a train going through Siberia. I was like, well, this is murder on the Orient Express. I mean, this yeah. is, you know, <laughs> this is a Perot <laughs> story <Yeah. laughs> right here. So it was very, and you know what else it reminded me of? Another great train story is the Doctor Who episode. From oh. Peter Capaldi's seasons. Yeah, Mummy on the Orient Express. Yeah, there was Mummy on the Orient Express. So that was like a monster murder mystery on the train, sci-fi, you know, yeah. like, I was like, oh, this, you know, obviously it predates those things. Well, it doesn't well, predate Murder on the Orient Express. We're big Express. Doctor Who fans anyway, and it really scratches that itch. Yeah, Cause this felt a, very Whovian. Yeah. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and just start rolling into our standouts. Sure. Really, the first thing I'll mention, and we just touched on it. The direction of the film and the screenwriting of the film. Mm. I love kind of the clever plot development. 
And I love the misdirection and how you think it's going one way. And as soon as you feel like you got it figured out, it shifts on you. And, you know, a big part of that is the writing, mm -hmm. you know, the story itself, the source material. Uh, but then another thing is the direction. You know, it has a unique vibe to it. Mm -hmm. It does. You mentioned the murder on the Orient Express. It kind of feels that married with the thing. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, you have that, like, I don't know who to trust. Mm -hmm. Like, who's alien and who's not. Oh, yeah. And the alien beings, like, jumping around. Yeah. 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 So it can transfer from one body to the next. So it keeps you guessing the whole film. Mm -hmm. and I think that's exciting to me. You know, I like it when I don't know what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. So that part of that's the direction. Of course, the direction. I love the visuals, the, uh, you know, the, the way they shot different things. Mm -hmm. Like for the most part, they did keep the monster in the dark. There was yeah. once or twice when they didn't. It probably mm -hmm. they should have. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, just overall, I think the storytelling, I, I thought it was inventive and creative. And for of its time, I thought it was pretty good. Right. For sure. Uh, there's also pretty good effects in this, right? The, yeah. the wide eyes, I'd be interested to know, because I feel like this definitely predates, I don't know, we're using contacts on people in the 70s. Yeah. I guess we are. But yeah, they're so. all of the, you know, the zombified or the dead people have these creepy white eyes. Mm -hmm. Um it was very kind of blood kind of dripping down. Yeah, from their blood running from their orifices. eye sockets. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's pretty, pretty gross. Um, and I, this was a slightly more convincing blood than your typical hammer horror, too. Yeah, it was a deeper True. red. It wasn't that Crayola red, like you know, somebody splashed a can of paint on everything. Like this yeah. was a little more convincing. Um, but yeah, the monster, like you said, he looks good in most scenes because they keep him mostly hidden. You're seeing him like through a peephole or like just the, yeah, that creepy arm. hand reaching through a crack or a doorway. Mm -hmm. And that really works well for the monster. When he gets fully exposed, you know, it's yeah. like a guy in a rubber suit with some hair glued on it or something. <laughs> but when he's, I think especially when you first see him, because you get that little brief like, excavation bit at the very beginning of the movie yeah. when Christopher Lee's team is pulling him out of the, you know, whatever, the dig site frozen that they're coming from. Or whatever, yeah. yeah, he's frozen and gross and obscured from ice, you know, chunks on him. Yeah. Um, that That's really good because he's he looks gross and terrifying, but you can't really see him either. Yeah. That's well done. And plus, when they shut off the lights, when somebody is... The alien, possessed by the alien, their mm -hmm. eyes turn red. Oh, and yeah. Their faces change. That makeup that they do is really good, too. That's I thought, true. Yeah. That's pretty good. And it works. It works. Yeah, it works. Especially, I mean, like you said, they're working on a pretty tiny budget, I think, here. So, yeah. Very good use of it. You know, the other standout I'll throw out, and, and this is kind of a wide uh, net to cast, but, man, I, I said cast. The cast. <laughs> <laughs> the cast. Uh, you know, it's cool to see Lee and Cushing team up. And it's funny because Lee plays this uber serious role. Yeah. And when they come to say, hey, we want the key to this box. We want to see what's inside this thing. Mm -hmm. And he does a little quick little toss, throws it outside. <laughs> he throws the key from the train window. <laughs> it's funny to see him act super serious. And I think what he sees is dollar signs. He's found the missing link. Yeah. You and I were kind of talking about our past a little bit in the 80s. There was all this rage of trying to find the missing link. That's true. Yeah. Just a short time ago, people were saying, we got to find this missing link to really prove this thing out. Right. And so this movie kind of plays off that. Like, right. And so he's like, yep, I proved it right here. I got it in this box. I have it here. <laughs> yeah. And he didn't want anybody to, you know, spoil that for him or take right. that away from him. He had the proof. Right. Uh, and then Cushing plays a scientist, or he's a doctor, I should say, mm -hmm. smart guy, but he has some of the comedic parts of this. Yeah, he's, he gets to play the lighter role, for yeah. sure. He's not playing it as straight as Christopher Lee is. Yeah, yeah. We've seen him in far more serious roles mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you mentioned the father. Wow, you know, I looked up his filmography and... There's all these movies I don't know because I thought, man, this guy has such gravitas about him. Like, Oh, yeah. His face is so expressive. You know, we keep using uh, Rasputin. He gives Rasputin vibes. Yes. I mean, the second he came on the screen and I realized like he's this, you know, Eastern Orthodox priest. I was like, oh, they're playing this guy like he's a Rasputin character. Like yeah. he's a, and he totally is. That's what he is. The whole, 
you yeah. know? And I think that's even why they were willing to let him do that quick switch from like, I'm one of, mm-hmm. I'm on the side of the light and now, nope, I want to be Satan's, you know, yeah. handmaiden or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think that was like a whole Rasputin thing we're messing with there, but yeah. it was interesting. And he really, like he, yeah, gravitas was a good word. And what a look, kind of crazy hair, crazy beard, and these mm-hmm. eyes. Very yeah. intense eyes. Very yeah. intense, yeah. Uh, we have Sylvia Tortosa playing the Countess. Mm-hmm. Very beautiful girl. And she's kind of smug. Like, she does, doesn't does seem too bothered most of the time. No. And I think, you know, she's obviously super rich. She gets everything she wants. Mm-hmm. And this seems a little bit like a game to her. Oh, for sure. And then uh, Telly Savalas. What do you think of Telly Savalas? Because, uh, you know, he shows up really late in the movie. Yeah. And tonally, he's very different than all these other people. Oh, yeah. I mean, what, what did you think about him overall? Like how, what he added to this movie or did he take away from the movie? Um, yeah, he kind of took me out of things. I felt like they, the point where he and his soldiers jump into the movie, it was like, well, buddy, you're too late. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I knew that he wasn't going to come onto the scene and fix all the problems. Yeah. You know, you just knew that's not the way this movie was headed. So then it was right. like, why are you here? <laughs> yeah. So you saw him as kind of like a distraction kind of. A little bit. Yeah. He was a little, took me out of it a bit. Yeah. He didn't bother me. I, I guess when it happened, I was like, where the heck is this movie going? Yeah. You know, it kind of became the Dirty Dozen a little bit. You know, <laughs> I associated with the Dirty Dozen. Of course, Telly Savalas went on to play Kojak. Yeah. For years and years. And I think for me, I kind of resented him sidelining the story a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so and it looked like he's a tough guy. And you're like, man, I like this guy less than I like the alien. <laughs> and then when the alien comes in and takes out all of those soldiers, and it injected a lot of excitement into the movie all of a sudden. Uh huh. So I did appreciate Telly's role from that perspective. Okay, I could see that. All right. I think that's good for standouts. Are there any setbacks to this film, in your opinion? Well, there were definitely some extraneous plot points, like things that I think you could just go in with your little exacto knife, cut out of the story, and no one would miss them. Right. And one would be a whole character, like I think I barely mentioned at the beginning, and you didn't even mention in the list of characters, her name was Natasha, and she's like a spy she mm-hmm. plays up like she's a damsel in distress in the beginning of the movie yeah. to get a passage on the train so people don't know who she is or what she's up to. But she's really a spy trying to find this like special type of metal that somebody on the train has, mm-hmm. which I think the Countess has, actually. Yes. Um, but it's really such just like an unnecessary plot point mm-hmm. that it's it just doesn't... It just takes up space and time in yeah. the movie. You know, it just didn't need to be there at all. So I felt like... You know, I, I hate to say, thankfully, she gets picked off, but <laughs> but it, it's better once her character is no longer amongst the living. We don't have to deal with her anymore because <laughs> she really was just kind of taking up space. Yeah, yeah. I could see that. I think they were trying to set up that this metal was important for the alien to be able to escape the Earth's orbit. And so they use that, but it's like... They didn't really need to do that. We, they didn't need to add that into this movie. Right. Like he could have figured that out later. Right. right. It just was <laughs> unnecessary. Yeah. Exactly. You know, another setback I'll throw out there is you don't have a lot of emotional investment in most of the characters. Mm-hmm. Of course, Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, if you're a horror fan, they kind of get a pass. You probably already like them anyway. Right. <laughs> You've seen them in other films. This film is fairly fast paced. They throw a lot of information at you, lots of pivots, twists and turns, things that you know I like. There's this whole plot development where the monk switches sides. You know, he's right. gonna reject his religion and serve the devil, you know. And I think they could have developed that story a little more. Yes. They hint at that he has a a strong affection for the countess that the count embarrasses him in front of her. And he resents that. Yeah. Belittles him a lot, but he still kind of looks up to this guy as a little bit of an authority figure. Mm -hmm. So they, we only know this because they just tell us in a a one-off line or two. Right. And I feel like they could have developed that more without telling us they could have just showed us, Oh, Mm -hmm. you know, he really cares about her. 
And, you know, the, his whole transition, I feel like could have been better explained. Like perhaps he did some sort of Faustian deal with this oh. alien. You know, hey, I'll serve you, but I want the Countess as my own. Right, right. And then he would say, okay, well, I can kind of see why he's, you know, like I don't agree with this, but I, I can see what the motive is for him to switch teams. Sure, sure. You know, and you also have kind of that Saxton Wells rivalry that mm-hmm. we only pick up on a little bit, like, but they don't really go into that too much. No, and I would say it. And that felt very one-sided. Like Saxon, of course, was playing everything very close to the vest. Like, yeah. like he felt a rivalry and he wanted to keep his frozen monkey, you know, secret. Right. But but Wells was, seemed just kind of, I don't know, a little happy-go-lucky, but curious, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like he didn't really, it didn't seem like he was trying to steal his punchline mm-hmm. or steal his big discovery. He just wanted to know what he had in his box. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. <laughs> he kind of played that more from a like, ah, oh, just, you know, what you got in your box. Yeah. Not from a like, I'm going to steal it and I'm going to get rich, you know? Right. Yeah. I picked up that like Indiana Jones, he has this rivalry with the French archeologist mm-hmm. Belloc. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that movie does a much better job in showing that, oh, there's this long history between exactly. these two. No, you don't have to pick that up from like a string of dialogue. Like, yeah. It's in their acting. It's in their like, you can just tell they have a history by the way they converse. Yeah. You know? Yeah. As far as your favorite scene in this film, what comes to mind? Okay. So it's not really a scene. It's actually kind of the payoff from one scene early in the train to like some realizations that you have to come to later in the plot. And that is, I actually made fun of, so when the, the ape thing is still in the box, still inhabited by the alien, whatever it is, um, he's killed the porter and the porter has dropped a nail or a screw or something. And you see the little apey arm kind of reaching out. It's not little, it's kind of big Mm -hmm. reaching out, gets a hold of a nail and starts picking the padlock that's on the box that he's in. Mm -hmm. And I laughed and I was like, okay, this is supposed to be a prehistoric creature. Yeah. How does it know what the heck a lock is and to pick a lock? I'm like, okay, guys, come on. And we he didn't did it think like this three through. Three seconds. <laughs> yeah. And he picked the lock easy, like he was that gum Sherlock Holmes or something, yeah. you know, like uh-huh. easy peasy. So I was like, okay, really? I, you know, like I kind of scoffed at it. Well, mm-hmm. then as the plot unravels and we kind of poo pooed some of their extraneous plot points, this is where it actually really paid out. It's like you realize just a few a uh, handful of scenes later that oh it's an alien being it's learning as it goes it's been around for millions of years and it killed a thief that was trying to pick its lock <laughs> on the platform of the train station yeah at the very beginning of the movie so it now knows what the thief knows yeah it's got lock picking knowledge oh <laughs> and like it all comes together and you're like wow that was pretty brilliant actually like yeah. I, I get that now because here i was like, oh, come on, guys. A prehistoric creature doesn't even know what a lock is. And then I'm like, <laughs> oh, they got me. They got me good. So I was I was impressed with that. Like, that plot really had a good payout. Yeah. Yeah. No, I enjoyed that, too. That's something I, I guess I didn't really catch until the second viewing. I will say, mm. like, this is one you probably should watch twice because there are more payoffs like that as you watch. The exactly. Film. Yeah. You got to look past the extras. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a couple scenes I'll throw out. Um, I did really enjoy the eye test scene, you know, when they're going mm-hmm. in, they're realizing there's photographic images imprinted in the fluid of the eye. Right. Which scientifically, uh, I don't think that's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm pretty sure it's not, but okay. But it's an alien, maybe it's accurate. You know what they say, the eye is the window to the soul. (laughs) What had happened previously, let me just remind you, the inspector enters the Count's room and he lets everybody know that the fossil has been killed. Mm -hmm. And the monk says, the beast is not dead. (laughs) Oh, yeah. He says, I put four bullets in him. You think evil can be killed with bullets? (laughs) Satan lives. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the unholy one is among us. And just a scene or two later, he goes in, he looks at this eyeball fluid, uh-huh. and he sees an image of the earth. 
and he like freaks out and everybody else is trying to figure out what does this mean? You know, how can he right. see the earth? And he's like, you know, when Satan had been cast from heaven and was descended upon the earth, oh, yeah. one of the images he saw was the earth and his eyes are just humongous and he's got real penetrating eyes. He anyway. does. Yes. Intense. So it's real intense. And at this point, you don't know it's an alien story. You're thinking like, oh, this isn't a monster story. This is like... Good versus evil. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Man against demons type thing. Right. And so I thought it was really effective because that, that was the first like real hard pivot. I was like, oh, wow. You know, this is intriguing. They, mm -hmm. they got me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I will say later on, we talked about Telly Savalas coming in, acting big and bad. And he's got all these soldiers, they all have guns, and you're like, what is this one alien going to do to get out of this? Because he got shot before yeah. by a guy. Well, somehow he gets behind him. I don't know if he goes up above the car and comes out the other side. I don't and know. And he shows up, he's got those freaky eyes, he's looking at guys, touching them, and as soon as he does, they turn the white-eyed stuff. And he just takes out this whole troop of soldiers. Yeah. And at that point, I remember feeling emotionally like, oh, crap. Like, what are <laughs> what are these two scientists going to do? <laughs> and all these uh, people in the car, what are they going to do? Right. Yeah. <laughs> How are they going to save themselves? So, yeah, those two scenes stand out to me as favorites. Mm. But I do have a something I wanted to ask you. Okay. Do you think this was purely an alien story? Uh, because there were some things that I wondered about. Are they trying to say that this alien isn't just an alien, but he is kind of pure evil? Is he the devil? Is he, you know, something from that ilk? Because when he was at the train station, that chalk would not write the cross oh, on the box. Oh, that's right. And then that scene where I reenacted a moment ago when he was talking about, you know, you don't kill Satan. And he was right next to the alien. And if you remember, the candle blew out and the crucifix tumbled to the ground. Yeah. And that's when, I think that's the moment when the monk was like, uh-oh. Well, this guy's powerful. He's very powerful and he's somebody I can see and touch. And he's right in front of me. Here. Right. So it made me wonder, like, did they completely abandon the good versus evil thing? Was it just an alien story? If it was, why did they have those kind of religious elements to it? That's What's a your great question. Of? And I think that those questions might just stay unanswered because it was filmed in two weeks. Yeah. You know, so I think there's just some editorial steps that get missed when you're making a movie in two weeks. Like, how do you yeah. <laughs> catch all those loose ends? You yeah. know, uh, it makes me think of some of the, the, more recent, not the very recent, because we stopped watching Doctor Who several years ago, but some of those later episodes, seasons of Doctor Who, where they would start out, the episode would start out with so many plot lines. Yeah. And you're like, how in the world are we going to wrap this up? And you just couldn't. You couldn't at the end of an episode. Yeah. There would be all these threads left unraveled because right. it was like, there's too many to chase down. And I think, I think that might be what happened here. Yeah. Like it was an interesting idea and they're like, yeah, throw that in. But then you didn't have time to bring it to fruition or to explain it. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we get into final summations? This is where we say yay or nay. So what say you, Kim, yay or nay, to the Horror Express? It's a yay for me uh, because I was delightfully surprised. Yes, it has its you know extraneous plot points and some things that you're going to have to overlook. Uh, but if you go into it thinking it's just another Hammer horror film, which there's nothing wrong with that, like there there's some interesting things here and some things that make you think and mm -hmm. kind of keep you guessing too, and then some extra things that'll really keep you guessing. Yeah. <laughs> But I found it uh, entertaining and just, uh, you know, a delightful twist on what I'm used to seeing Cushing and, and Lee do. Yeah, yeah. I agree. It's a yay for me. I already mentioned the way it subverts expectations. Mm -hmm. It keeps you plugged into the film the whole time. Yeah, for sure. So I did enjoy that. I enjoyed the performances. I enjoyed just, again, you know, anytime you have this murder mystery type vibe, 
married with some of the thing, you know, yeah. one of my favorite horror movies of all time. Mm-hmm. You know, that's really effective. Is that the theme for season three? I think you mentioned that in both of your episodes with Mike. Too. Yeah, yeah, we did. <laughs> Everything goes back to the thing now, guys. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> but yeah, this is a yay for me. Time to review our fan interactions. So this is from our Instagram account. We have Yakbleda Gumbla. What? <laughs> He's a friend of our account. He's messaged us a few times. I don't know how to say that, though. Yak, blah, da, gum, blah. All right. However you say that, you need to send us like a phonetic pronunciation. Yes, for please that. do. He says, this is one of at least two films. The other was At the Earth's Core, where I laugh at Peter Cushing defending his Britishness. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Here, when the main inspector says to Cushing and Lee, but what if one of you is the monster? Cushing, obviously offended, snorts, monster? We're British, you know. <laughs> Cushing is my favorite British hero, bar none, and the fact that he did this movie so soon after his beloved wife's death is a mark of what a great man he was. Ah, oh, somebody else is a Cushing buff. Yes. He also goes on to say, of course, Christopher Lee supposedly convinced his pal to take the part. So good on him, too. And the movie's obviously great fun. Having played enemies in so many films, it's awesome to see them as allies in a movie. Man, he could have written our script for this episode. Yeah, you could have joined <laughs> us. Louis X. Veroid says, this film is a must-watch prior to the Orient Express. Yeah, exactly. So this would be a good doubleheader, right? Yeah, I think so. Monster Zerone says, love it. We have Retro Horror Vault gives this two thumbs up. Least Worst Option says, Sylvia Tortosa. And it has like romantic eyes and Helga Linne <laughs> romantic eyes. So. They were very attractive ladies. <laughs> and for the first time ever, we have a voice message from a listener. And you'll probably recognize his voice because it's our good friend, Mike. If you'd like to leave us a message, maybe you have thoughts and comments on what we've been watching. You can do that anywhere you listen to your podcast. Scroll down in our episode notes and there should be a link where you can leave us a voicemail. Hi, this is Mike got a chance to watch horror express this week and uh man what a roller coaster that movie was for me uh starting out i thought it was extremely cheesy uh with the monster uh being able to inherently know how to pick locks and be able to get out of his crate uh but then after the, you know it explained a little bit more and the story uh it made a little bit more sense with him being able to take over people's minds and uh, cool special effects with the red eyes. And uh, man, at the end where they, he controls the dead soldiers to rise up and to attack. What a cool ending to that movie. Uh, man, if you haven't seen it, it's worth a watch. Take care. Okay, so we've had three episodes in a row where we released weekly. Mm -hmm. But we are going to go back to our every two-week format we just wanted to kick off season three with three in a row. But moving forward, the next episode you hear will be in two weeks. All right. So what are we doing next? All right. So we actually are kicking off a little series we're calling The Summer Swim. Ooh. Do you dare to go in the water? I think I might. And we are going to be reviewing some monster movies that involve things in the water. And yes, I know what you're thinking we're going to say, but we're not starting with that one. So hang with us. <laughs> we are starting with the 1977 film called Orca. Uh, Google tells me that this is an ocean-going tale with ecological overtones in which a ruthless profiteering fisherman accidentally kills the pregnant mate of a canny killer whale. It's Jaws meets Moby Dick as the bounty hunter becomes the target of the enraged Grief-stricken creatures craving for vengeance. Nice. Yeah. I have never seen this. I do see that it is rated PG. I think it does involve some biting and swallowing and chewing of humans by <laughs> large sea-dwelling mammals. So keep yes. that in mind. He is a killer whale. Yes. Not a tickling whale. <laughs> a killer whale. <laughs> not a happy whale. Not a singing whale. A killer whale. That's right. Yes. That's right. So happy to have you back, Kim. Thanks. Good to be back. So how do we wrap this up? Uh, I think we say go watch Orca. Join us back here in two weeks. Yes. And enjoy your movies. 
And yeah, happy movie watching. Peace out. Peace out.